Hello. How are you? I'm here alone in my room. Oh, but not for long. Hi, Abundant Joy. Abundant Joy is already here. We needn't go no further. Ha ha ha. And Nomad Rose and eight others. Whoa. Hi, guys. Hi, folks. You're not all guys. Some of you are folks. Wendy and Ellen and Mirabelle, oh, and Amy and Tracy. Tracy, you're in again. Like, this is fantastic. You should get a, I don't know, a mug or something. We've got Anne Kareen from Lilyhammer. We've got Laurie. Hi, Laurie. How you doing? We've got Ginny. we got um, Suzanne. We've got Esther and Vale and Catherine. Oh, so fun. Hi. Hi. I'm so happy to see you. I love your little round faces not your you don't have little round faces you have little round uh things that show your faces <laughs> trish is here and a whole bunch of people so let's see how many we have mm. oh only 75 we're gonna keep talking tan is here tan is that you tana yes i think that's tana and stacy and amy and stephanie and vincy and cheris and lizzie uh, leasley oh she's from denver Ooh. um oh I just happened to see Chris's question about a book about a a prodigy violinist. And Brooke wants to know what the book is. And the book is called Gone. Gone, gone, gone. Because, yeah, you'll find out why it's called Gone. Okay, I'm readjusting my screen. And we are ready to go. Yay! Thank you for joining me here. I love this place and this time. And today I'm talking about, the subject is out loving your fear, which is kind of, we've talked about it many ways, but with anxiety disorders at an all time high, the whole world round, I think it's worth talking about a lot. And I'm writing a book about it. So I talk about that because I've been working on it. So I got a chance to practice what I preached this week because I had a very full week, I shall say. Yeah, I mean, I had projects to finish that I was that I really had to focus on. We were doing, we, we were trying to learn better technicals for our podcast, Rowan and I, you know, like trying to make the machines work is a whole nother thing where you have to go back and forth with record things and listen and get, yeah, technical help. And we, I had presentations to give and classes to teach. And then I had to meet a bunch of new people, which hasn't happened since the pandemic began. I mean, except here, which is safe because I can run. I, if y'all get aggressive, I'm out that door and there is nothing you can do to catch me uh, in the short term. There were, oh my gosh, we had visitors who were wonderful, but in the in the busyness of it all, it was like, oh, I want to pay attention to my visitors and I'm doing all these other things. So it all added up to stress. And for me, stress goes to anxiety. And it, you know, if it gets bad enough, it goes to other emotions and physical breakdowns and everything. But the first thing I do when I'm anxious, I, I, when I'm stressed is I feel anxiety. So I'm like, okay, I've been writing about this. I better be able to fix it, right? Way of integrity. If you can't live it, don't try to give it. So I started to see this as an opportunity. I am going to use my own tools on myself to try to get beyond the fear. Uh, so yes, I love to, I started with a quote from Rilke, the Rainier Maria Rilke, the great German poet. And I've heard this over and over and I thought, okay, I'll tell you the truth. It's a beautiful statement, but I've always thought it was kind of maybe not true. He says, perhaps everything that frightens us is in its deepest essence, something helpless that wants our love. That's such a sweet thing to say. And I, when I hear it, it used to like put my teeth on edge because, okay, so Rilke, my friend, are you telling me that Vladimir Putin, who is like t trying to take a country and killing a whole bunch of people in the process for nothing more than ego, are you saying he is in his deepest essence, something that helpless that wants our love? Like we're supposed to go cuddle that one? And not to mention, you know, other dictators, psychopaths, serial killers. Really? Are we su supposed to like rock their little cradles and say, what can I do for you? Ah, I wasn't buying it. But I thought, you know, if there's something about it that rings true, I just haven't finished out and figured out what rings true about it. So I thought, all right, break it down. 
what is something I fear in its deepest essence? Because that is stipulated. And I thought about how when I'm sound asleep at night, because I don't live in Ukraine, I have the luxury of not thinking about Vladimir Putin at all. When I am completely engrossed in a project of some kind, I stop worrying about climate change. Is it worrying me in the back of my mind somewhere? Yes, but I'm focused on something like if I'm trying to do some kind of complex scheduling. Scheduling my calendar is literally the scariest thing in the world. I don't like it. Um, <laughs> and I have people to help me, which is good because I'm terrible at it. But um, in its deepest essence, what is everything I fear? I thought, okay, the something I fear is not in the, in the space with me except inside my own head. So I've never met Vladimir Putin, never want to meet Vladimir Putin. The only reason I'm afraid of him is that there's something inside my head that says, I need to worry about this. Climate change is a real thing. If you don't think so, go find some friends who agree with you. I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna throw the rope that wide. You know, the science is very solid and the weather is very weird. And is that alarming? Yeah, but when I'm lying in bed in a room that is the right temperature for now, the presence of climate change for me, the deepest essence of the thing I fear is my own brain, my thoughts about what's happening. So we're back to all of you who have done the coach training and all of you who have read my books and everything, you know that I really hammer on the idea that the biggest thing that causes our suffering is not our situations, but our thoughts about our situations. So even if, um, something really scary is actually happening. Like somebody is physically attacking you. I took karate for eight years and I, I was in this dojo with a lot of big, strong dudes whom I adored. And they, they all had jobs as like night security guards at high finance banks and stuff because they actually kind of wanted to get attacked so they could use their karate. So, if a violent criminal came at them, what they would think is, oh, oh, oh. <laughs> it wouldn't be, <gasps> you know, there, maybe there would be some kind of fear, but it would be channeled immediately into action. So they really weren't afraid. They didn't walk down the street afraid. That's one of the things, the privilege of, of men, you know, it gets talked about a lot among feminists, the idea that a man really doesn't have to walk down the street scared, but women are always on the alert mainly we don't get attacked usually we don't get attacked but in our heads there's the possibility that we can so i'm not saying you eradicate that i'm not saying you stop saying we have to you know stop crime on the streets and stop crime against women and stop climate change and stop vladimir putin if we can i'm not saying we have to agree with the circumstance what i'm saying is that if we are afraid in that moment the thing that is actually revving up our fear is a part of ourselves and it's Yep, here he is, Rainier Maria Rilke, he's right. That part of ourselves, which is the real cause of our fear, its deepest essence, always is something helpless that wants our love. So um, I, I've been writing this book on, um, on anxiety and how to get out of it. And when, you, when I get to the issue of um, the part of our minds that scare us, it's, it happens, as I've told you many times, in the left hemisphere of the brain, primarily. And the reason we get anxious, so animals, when they're not in the presence of something frightening, will just settle down and sleep. Humans will settle down and gnaw our fingernails to the elbow because we're so anxious, right? And that's because of the parts of us that are scaring us inside our own heads. And when we get the idea that we should be afraid of something, it starts a feedback cycle in our heads. So a feedback cycle in behavior is like if somebody yells fire in a crowded theater and runs for the exit and nobody else believes him, it'd be like, oh, that guy is afraid and he's running for his life. I hope he gets help. I hope he gets help. But if another person then goes, what fire, fire, and and everybody starts getting, oh no, fire, and they're, they're, they all start to run, one person's fear has fed into the system causing an increase in fear for another person 
who causes an increase in fear for other people. So before long, everybody's really, really scared. We have this in my house continuously because during the pandemic, as I'm sure most of you have been doing, we get a lot of things in the mail. So it's less now than it was during the big lockdowns, but our dogs have not gotten used to it at all. <laughs> and every time the, mail the mailman brings a package, our dogs go bat crap. They are terrified. They bellow and scream and run around the house with their fingernails scrabbling. Rah! Something horrible is happening. And then like Karen, who's napping, is like, what, what? And then we're all like, oh my God, Karen's worried. Ah! So it's an unregulated feedback cycle. And when you get an unregulated feedback cycle in your own brain, your story about what you should be afraid of causes more fear, which gives out a pulse of fear that is nonverbal, which is then reinterpreted by the verbal part into a reason to be afraid and told as a story back to the part that becomes afraid. So it goes and it is very, very unpleasant. Any unregulated self-reinforcing feedback system ultimately destroys itself. It will get to a point where it just, the system can't hold up. So we have a, when we're scared and we keep getting more scared, there's a part of us that is in an unregulated self-reinforcing feedback cycle and it will not be, it will not feel good and it will eventually be catastrophic. So what do we do about that? Rilke says, we have to go to the essence of the thing we fear, which wants, it's a helpless thing that wants our love. All right, okay. It's not Vladimir Putin's inner child, it's yours. <laughs> it's not, um, you know, it's not the weather scientists talking about climate change. It's the part of us that starts to like extrapolate all the nightmare scenarios of what could happen to us, to our children. That part of us needs our love. So what we do is we go into the, we go and find the part that's caught in the cycle. There's a part that's caught in this unregulated cycle. And it's, you can assume that it's a child. Um, it usually is. And what it's trying to do is preserve life and health for you and all the other parts of your system. So this part of you has taken on the responsibility of scaring you enough that you won't allow things to harm you, like Vladimir Putin or climate change. It doesn't know that those two things really can't be controlled from inside your bedroom right now. So, I mean, we can do what we, we contribute to good causes and do social activism and do all that, yes, but if you're trying to get to sleep and you can't, you can't stop being afraid, you need to figure out how old this part of you is, the part that is really afraid, the part that is, it gets triggered, right? By events in the world, by people's comments on Facebook, by people um, yelling at each other on TV, it's gonna trigger these helpless parts. And if you go in and you talk to them, you'll say, oh, right, okay. Um, you're just a kid and oh yeah, I remember my, your parents used to fight. So my parents used to fight. Oh, we had parents that fought and this is triggering us with a, whatever. So you do a little bit of therapizing on yourself, but here's the thing, going back into the part of you that's afraid and analyzing the reason they're afraid reinforces the negative feedback, the feedback of fear. I'm going to say that again, cause it's really important. So the Freud believed that if you just talk about your problems and you can get to the root of them, okay, I um, don't like hamburgers because of my psychosexual development and my relationships before I was five years old. Okay, you can spend a lot of time going down those alleys, um, down rabbit holes. Um, so uh, you can't, talking about it, the talking cure, talking about it endlessly, why you're afraid, does not stop the feedback loop of fear. It increases it. It's like, yep, I have, not only does Vladimir Putin scare me, but my own parents scared me, and that's why I'm so scared. So you're giving yourself more reasons to be afraid. That's, when you're first dealing with a trauma, you really need to talk about it and tell someone, someone's safe. 
But if you do it over and over and over, you just get an unregulated negative feedback cycle. So instead, what I have been practicing, and it really has worked for me, is first you recognize and validate the fear. So you're like, oh, there's a little part in, of me that is helpless, that wants my love, and it's terrified, and it's right here with me, and the things that are frightening it are out there. So I'm just going to say to it, I understand why you're afraid. Anyone would be afraid going through what you're going through, of course. And I'm right here. So you recognize and validate the part of you that is helpless and frightened. And you just say, oh man, I get it. I get why this is scaring you so much. And I'm right here. Then you're not caught in the feedback cycle because part of you is talking from outside it. So that starts to shift the energy in your brain into the part that can be calm. So then here's a little strategy I found while I was working through all this stuff. It's not an experiment. It's a song. It was a, a song that I heard one day when I was feeling very anxious, not recently, but I was really blown away by how calm I felt listening to this song. And it's by, um, I'm sure you guys know it. It's by Nightbird. This woman who was on, I think she was on The Voice or one of those competitive singing shows and she was dying of cancer. And she had written this song and I'm going to read you part of the song. It's okay, it's okay, it's okay, it's okay. If you're lost, we're all a little lost and it's all right. It's okay, it's okay, it's okay, it's okay. If you're lost, we're all a little lost and it's all right. It's all right, it's all right, it's all right. It's, the, it's all right. Sheer repetition. There's nothing there that changes the situation in Ukraine or the climate but just the repetition of it's okay, it's all right, it breaks the self-reinforcing feedback cycle because now you're focusing on something that doesn't fit into that cycle. And if you, what you do is you can just say that to yourself or listen to Nightbird's song, go online and listen to it. If you can start to come down from anxiety, even a little, that means you're out of the feedback loop, you're not locked in. And remember, the feedback loop of fear is trying to keep the system healthy. It's trying to regulate your, so you hear about climate change and the part of you that's scared goes, oh my God, we got to, we've got to do something to change this, right? And then it, it's trying to regulate this, the world around it to make everything safe for you. But what it doesn't realize is that getting stuck in that is going to make life hell for you. So the idea is you need to find another way to regulate your internal system. And you can do that. I just tapped my chest a couple of times. I was talking to somebody who uses tapping. There's a, something called EFT, where if you tap certain parts of your body, it can be really, really calming. Um, you can go for a walk. You can listen to Nightbird song. You can get a cuddle with your cat. You can watch something funny online that makes you laugh. And in that moment, you won't be caught. Uh, so you find a way to regulate the system and get creative. It doesn't have to be shifting all the circumstances so that they won't scare you. It's just finding the helpless part, acknowledging its fear, telling it it's going to be all right. Everything's all right. And then saying, here's what I'm going to do. What could I do that would make you feel more comfortable? And it will often tell you. And ideas will come to you, maybe not right at first, but more and more, the more you practice. Okay, here are the questions coming in. So Kirsten says, I've been anxious about becoming anxious again. That is the heart and soul of anxiety disorder. The feeling of fear is so frightening that we become frightened of our feeling of fear. And so that feeling is frightening. And you just a that is the mechanism, yeah. Kirsten says, pre-COVID, I dealt with anxiety constantly. When everything shut down, I detoxed from everything and the anxiety went away. Now I'm starting to reemerge and I don't have anxiety or even stress. I'm just enjoying everything. I have moments though of thinking something's missing and then I realize it's the anxiety. I read a, a terrific book um, this last week by a woman named Catherine May. It's called The, the Electricity of Every Living Thing. She's a British author. She's really, um, you know, got a fine mind, beautiful soul. And this book, spoiler alert, it's about how she self-diagnosed herself as being on the autism spectrum pretty 
significantly when she was 38 years old. She said, I've learned to act normal, but the fact is there's so much stimulation coming at me from the world that I, she actually goes into something called, she calls whiteouts, where she cannot cope with the, the electricity that is bombarding her brain because people on the autism spectrum are very, very sensitive to energies of all kinds. So what she said was really interesting to me though. She said at one point in the book, if I'd been, if I'd lived 200 years ago, I would never be in big crowds. You know, if I was just in some village, I would not have electric lights flashing at me from every part of everywhere. I would not um, travel in crowded transports that have flashing lights and are moving really fast and everything. And she said, I could have been way out on the spectrum of autism. And because the world doesn't assault, wouldn't have assaulted my senses as much, I might not have been so triggered. And it would have been just like, okay, this is my way of being, but it, it never becomes a, a disability of any kind um, at her level because there wouldn't be anything, all her triggers would be missing. So I love that idea that we evolved from a much softer, gentler world and that all the energy coming at us all the time can really trigger our anxiety at a neurological level. And I would really say come out of the pandemic lockdown slowly and test while you go. I mean, Kirsten seems to have overcome it. But if you, for me, getting back into places where I'm traveling and I'm with people that I haven't met before and sometimes in crowds, I can feel that I could go back to that to being a much higher level of anxiety because I've, it's just our surroundings can trigger us. And then you have to really, really deliberately go and find the part of you that's been triggered and help regulate the system for it. Dr. Donna says, how do we find that helpless part of us that wants our love? If that part is, is so deeply hidden or that part is so young, it lacks verbal skill to share its fear. Good question. I always start, and I've always done this in coaching, by saying, feel the emotion and let it get big. So maybe this particular emotion is anxiety about climate change. Find the feeling of it in your body. So if I look for anxiety about climate change, it's like all the way from my eyes to my heart. Right, that, okay. So let it get big, ask it, what it wants to look like. Mine looks like a shield. It's interesting because I usually get animals and things, but it's a shield that comes out this way and then down to my heart. And it's trying to armor me against being in despair. So then I say to that shield, you know, um, so you, you need love. You, you're trying to regulate the system. You're trying to protect me from harm. So I just say to it, yeah, how, how are you? <laughs> How's that going for you? And it says, oh, it's really hard and it's not working very well. And then I say to it, well, maybe I could put you down. Where would you like to be put down? And it will say, okay, make me a, a velvet box or whatever. You can put it on the couch. You can put it outside in the grass, whatever, wherever it wants to be. And then imagine yourself setting it down. Or if it's say, an animal or a baby or something, you, you can just say, you can feel what it wants. Very often it wants to be picked up and held because that is safety for young children. So you can imagine yourself picking it up and holding it and saying, I've got you. I'm right here. It's all right. It's all right. It's okay. We're all a little lost. It's okay. I've got you. So yeah, you can just visualize it and then ask it for what would help it because it's been trying to help you always. All the parts of us are trying to help us. Chris says, what if you have trouble finding your inner child or getting them to talk to you? I can find the situations in my life that are affecting, but I have trouble tracking back to them. You don't have to track back to the situation. It's really a matter of where is this thing, this sensation in your body. And it doesn't necessarily have to feel like an inner child. It could feel like a ball of light or, um, you know, a pair of galoshes. But the, the trick in this type of methodology is to let your imagination work. 
Because if you can imagine your fear as some kind of person, place, or thing, and start imagining a dialogue with it, you are using the right side of your brain because that is very imaginative. And you're, the right side of the brain is feels your physical sensations and your emotional sensations. So if you can, if you're starting to imagine having compassion to part of yourself, um, you don't need to track anything back and it doesn't have to be your inner child. It's just the helpless part of you that needs your love. And it will tell you what it needs if you ask it. And you might go off, it might not work a few times. Eventually it will, it will. So yeah, we're trained not to notice our own pain. So it's hard to track it at first, but it's very, very attention getting. Suffering gets our attention. So eventually we do track it. So City Lotus says, do you ever talk to your inner child? For instance, say, I know you're afraid and I'll take care of you. All the time, constantly. And I go to other people and say, my inner child is worried. It wants to be taken care of. And they're like, oh yeah, we'll take care of you. Yeah, I, <laughs> I have a friend who, there was a meme um, going around with this little girl. And her mother says, ask for something by its proper name. And she says, I'm just a baby. I think I've told you this before. And then the mother says, yes, but you still have to do it this way. And the baby goes, I'm just a baby. And I, I, I got a text message, a, an audio text message from one of my friends who is the most competent, like she runs empires. She's incredibly brilliant and just never seems to have the slightest worry. And she, she just sent me an audio file that said, I'm just a baby. And I'm like, oh, I've got you. I've got you, baby. I'm cuddling you right now. So you can go to your friends. You can tell your dog to take care of you. Our dogs won't. They're busy barking at Amazon people. But um, yeah, you can definitely use all, throw everything you have at helping this troubled part of you, that is this innocent, helpless part that wants your love. Um, AG says, how do we distinguish between a fear that indicates there are stakes involved and we should go for it, Liz Gilbert style, and anxiety that indicates the wrong direction to go? This is one of the commonest questions people give to life coaches. And um, coaches trained in my system know this metaphor. If you are standing above a sparkling blue swimming pool on a very hot day and you're thirsty and sweaty and you really want to get in the water, but it's a long way down, that's a fear you might want to just go forward and, you know, feel the fear and do it anyway, Liz Gilbert style. <laughs> but if you imagine the same day, same diving board, same pool, but it's full of toxic sludge and it reeks and it has algae in it and like garbage, there will be the fear of falling is the same, but there will also be no desire to move forward. And that's how your body, I mean, the more you use your senses, like you drop into not just words, it's okay, it's okay, it's okay, it's all right. Those are nice words. They are associated with calm in our bodies, but it's just hearing the repetition of the sound that is calming to the part of the brain that's non-verbal. That's why we say to babies, it's okay, it's okay, it's okay. It's the sound that we need. So if you're standing on the diving board and you're nervous, but you want to go forward, that's when you go forward. If you're standing on the diving board and you're nervous and you're also repulsed, don't talk yourself out of that fear. Don't do it. Don't go forward. Back up. Go down the ladder. Okay. Laurie says, is hopelessness a form of anxiety? Sometimes, I mean, it's, it's a reaction to the same kinds of situations that can be caught, that can cause anxiety. So if you just feel like, oh, the lunatics are in charge of the asylum, there's just, uh, yeah, there's a fear of what's coming, but you've chosen the avenue of depression. So the, the, the five responses to danger are fight, flight, freeze, faint, or flop, sorry, those are the same, and uh, fallen, which is where you try to please people to get out of danger. But the flop response feels like depression. It's like, uh, because there's no way to help yourself. That 
has been shown in many experiments to happen to people who make extrapolations about their own helplessness or even animals, the famous learned helplessness of dogs. Um, in some experiments, they become hopeless about escaping something like an electric shock in their cage. And then when the cage doors open, they don't leave the cage because they've given everything up. So it's a, it's a reaction to frightening circumstances, but it's slightly different. You can out love that too. A um, couple more questions. Any advice for stepping out of hypervigilance and catastrophizing when that was what you were used to from an early age? Yeah, find the part of you that catastrophizes and is hypervigilant and say, oh, what are you, honey? Maybe you're a rabbit in the headlights. Maybe um, you're like somebody poised on a razor's edge that's over the Grand Canyon or whatever it is and say, oh yeah, yeah, you've been doing that for like 30 years now, aren't you kind of tired? Would you like to come try living with me off the razor's edge? Like you can have these conversations and a lot of times that part of you will respond. And just because you've been doing it for an early age does not mean that you can't stop it now. That's a victimization response and that will get you every time because it's not true. You can change your mind all any moment you can change your mind amy says does creating art help heal anxiety and psychic pain you are so ahead of me i don't even need to write this book you guys already know what's in it um yeah anything that is imaginative and synthesizing putting things together needs to go to the right side of the brain to to work and then it leaves this unreinforced uh, this yeah, unregulated reinforcing cycle behind because you can't actually make something and be in anxiety at the same time. Not if it's something like make something complex enough that you have to really focus on it. And then you'll find you'll come out later and realize, oh, I wasn't anxious that whole time. And it's because of the way the brain works. Um, Shazeg says, any tips on engaging your imagination more when your logic seems to always step in when you try? Yes, I would spend my time, if I were you, imagining what my logic looks like. I would draw pictures of it. I would pick out uh, images from the internet and make a board out of it and throw darts at my logic. I would like get playful, get curious and start thinking in terms of art, as Amy says, or crafts or whatever it is you want to make and the moment you engage the imagination, logic serves the imagination. So logic will push imag imagination away, but imagination will gladly use logic. So it doesn't push away the part of you that's afraid. It embraces it, includes it, and allows it to do its job. And that is, um, yeah, that's how you get out. That's how you outlove your fear. And I have outlasted the half hour we're supposed to be spending. So I'm just gonna give you lots and lots of love to all the helpless little parts that um, are feeling terrified and everything that frightens us, um, you know, going on in our own little heads. Let's get out of that anxiety cycle because when we start imagining and creating from the other parts of our brains, that's how we fix the world, right? Fear doesn't fix anything. Calm heals everything. Yeah. So thank you for being here and stay very calm. On our podcast, we say stay wild and wild creatures are usually very calm. So stay wild and stay calm. Mwah! And I'll see you back here on the gathering room at the same bat time next week. Mwah, mwah, mwah. That's, ooh. <laughs>